It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Hanita Rodney. You were born in Germany, miraculously. And Hanita, your, your, you grew up in Germany and your name when you were in Germany was, your parents gave you, Annalisa Lovi. That's right. So can you tell us, you were born in Berlin, but it was, it's a, a miracle how you were born. There was a miracle when I was born. I was thrown, taken as dead. I, I, my mother was six, six and a half months pregnant and they didn't even bother to see if I'm alive or not. Wrapped me up, put me in a bucket and then I screamed. This is what my mother told me, of course. I screamed and saved my life by screaming. So when I left Germany and she had to say goodbye to me then, she said, whenever you're in trouble, just scream. <laughs> And you were born in Berlin in, in July 1929? That's right. And your brother, he, your brother was... My uh, brother was born in 1927, uh, November 17th. I, I'm not sure anymore. And that's Hans. But in, uh, there's 18, about 18 months difference between us. And you were very close with your brother? Yeah. Uh, my brother was my keeper and my watchman when the Nazis started and I could only go and play if he was there but one day he wasn't there and I never found out where he was why he wasn't there and I went down to play and they were all his friends because our friends from school, I was young, I didn't have any. I was just in the first class. But his friends used to come and they were my friends. Until one day, they were dressed differently. And uh, I found that they were uh, dressed in brown, old brown uniform and Nazi uniform, which I didn't know at the time. But I felt sort of surrounded by all this brown color of shirts that were making noises. They were, they were starched and ironed. And I um, got rather frightened. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was in a dark cellar with uh, with these boys and they were older than me and was uh, in the dark and we had to go down a ladder and they sort of pulled me down the ladder and I tried to hold on to every rung but I couldn't uh, couldn't uh, manage that and then um, I was with the boys uh, for two weeks, um, molested in every way, sexually, mentally, the dirty Jew, you're a Jewess, you're a swine, there's no, nothing to protect you. Were you, for two, you never came home? I did when I, uh, after two weeks, took two weeks because I remember there was a woman who must have been of the house that I was in the cellar of and she must have known what was going on. She used to come in when the boys were at school and she told me always, shh, quiet. I brought you a new shirt, she brought me her husband's shirt, their sleeves were long and um, she came down the stairs, that, that, that particular stairs there. She held in one hand warm water. I, I could see steam coming from both hands. One was hot soup, the other one was hot soapy water. And she had her husband's uh, 
her husband's uh, shirt sleeve hanging down here and here she had towels to dry me, to wash me and to dry me and she said you mustn't tell her so because if I get, if she gets caught who's going to help me? So we both go, we both die. So she said you cannot tell them I've been here. I said yes but they'll see you've been here. I've got a clean shirt and you washed me down. She said, don't you worry. They don't see a thing. It's anyway in the dark, all in the dark. When how, she, how old were you at the time? How old was I? Nine. And you remember this very well? I was just early nine because uh, at, at um, halfway through nine, because of this, my father woke up um, and then found out about the kinder transport and I came on the last kinder transport. But can, it, can I ask, when they kept you for the two weeks, can. You, you were there for two whole weeks, you couldn't go, you couldn't Two whole escape. weeks, I, I was a kid of just nine and I just, I just didn't know anything about sex or men or boys or and I thought that's the end of my life and the only way I can get through it if I just turn myself to ice every time which I did they had a hard time I, I just froze I, I wouldn't and there was no ways you could escape or no until about too late Two weeks later, this lady used to come with water, and, but she said, don't tell anybody. Because then, if I, if I can't come and bring you soup and wash you down, and they can't see, uh, I said to her, but they can see it. I was scared of everything. She said, no, don't worry, they can't see. They won't know. They don't care anyway. They'll tear it off and that's it. But why didn't she take you out? Why didn't she? Well, she said if she was caught helping me, I don't know where I was, I don't know who she is. I just presume she was of the house that I was in. It was a huge cellar, must have been a huge house. And your parents and your brother must have been frantic. They, they didn't know where you were for two weeks. Ken, eventually, my, she said, the next time, it was like a thing opening at the top there with light, where the shaft where they came through, where the ladder started from the street. And they had to come all the way down the ladder to the cellar. Then I saw, she said to me, next time it will open, your brother is coming. I couldn't believe it. But he can't see. I remember her telling me so clearly, he can't see you. He's coming from the light. I learned about light and dark. He's coming from outside into the dark cellar. He can't see you. So you have to keep calling his name so that he knows whereabout you are by your voice. And I couldn't even get on my knees. I was crawling on all four. I kept saying, Hans, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm getting nearer. Open the shaft so I can see where you are. At least I can see the light, I'm going to the light. That was the best part of, of it all. And then I got to the ladder, which was leading to the shaft. Took a long time and I was scared the boys were going to come. And then my brother said, now you come up the ladder. I said, I can't. I can't move my legs one minute more. He said, okay, wait, I'll come down and fetch you up. He came down the ladder, took my hand. I was very, very thin, not like today. I was very thin, a few kilo. I hadn't eaten properly. You know. 
And then, uh, even at home, we don't eat properly. We didn't weren't allowed to buy food. Um, he he came down the ladder, took my hand, and sort of schlepped me up the ladder and out onto the road. And I was so scared. I said to him, "I wish I could run. I can't run." And he said, "You you don't have to run." walk slowly, hold my hand, and we were, it was maybe 50 meters from my home. And he took me home, and I thought, oh, wonderful, I love hugs, <laughs> like I hugged my daughter. I am full of hugs ever since. And a hot water bath and food, nothing. We got home, my mother was sitting on an armchair. She didn't, no, my father was sitting on the armchair. He didn't even move. He was out. They must have been there and broke them. And my mother was standing by the window, staring out of the window where I was supposed to be down there. She hadn't moved, she was like a statue. I don't know what they did to them. We'll never know. But uh, I didn't get that hug and the warmth and what I was waiting for. I was in shock again. Where's my mother? Why doesn't she turn around? And I called her name, Muti, Fati. And my father took me to the chair and, he, and he, without a word. Mm -hmm. And my brother, uh, my brother was the one who had the uh, most uh, energy of anybody to do anything. And then we had a Goisha lady, blonde, beautiful, who worked with my father in his business. And suddenly she walked in and she said, I'm here to make you food, to feed you, to look after you. But if the Nazis find out, I'll have to pay for it. She'll have to pay for it. She said, we might all have to pay for it. So we, I don't know, I was too small to understand all what was going on. But she stayed. Later on, I heard that she was, for helping us, she was moved over to East Berlin. We were Berlin. They moved her to punish her over to East Berlin. She, she was suffering from some illness. They wouldn't help her. And we, uh, by that time, uh, my husband and I were already married, we were in Israel, it was many years later, and she told us she's in East Berlin for punishment for helping then the, my family. And could we send her maybe some money, she needs medical care. And they wouldn't let her keep it. They took it away. We sent the money. We sent the money with a friend who had a mother in Berlin, and she had friends which worked for her and got the money to be called a Tante Bock. Her name was Gertrude Bock. And uh, she, she said they wouldn't let her keep the money. They had their eyes on her all the time, the East, East Berlin. So that's uh, how I was saved and... Uh, Can I ask, Anit, what is the first recollections you have of growing up in, in Berlin? Very happy ones. We were a family who loved uh, trekking. My father was a great sportsman. I was in the Olympiada in 1936. <laughs> I, I, I think I was seven years old or something. 
Uh, he was you, a terrific sport. You went sport. to watch the, the Olympic Games? No, no I, I performed, I ran. I did a run. He got me into, the, into a run, running competition. Ken, he, he was determined, he was a great sportsman himself. And uh, skiing, he used to go skiing in the winter, he used to put me on his skis. <laughs> at the, you know, you have the long skis and they have a little tip at the end. And I used to sit at the end of that ski and hold on to the tip while he went down the slopes and up the slopes. And can I ask, um, did you grow up in a traditional family? Uh, no, we had no religious uh, of any kind. I didn't even know I was Jewish. Really? It was never talked about until the Nazis told me. You, you never had Pesach or...? I, I didn't know what they were talking about, quite honestly, at the time. I heard what happened to our neighbours and that uh, the Jews are being killed and I, I knew all that. But I didn't know I was Jewish at that time, till I was in the cellar and they called me... How did they know you were Jewish? How did... How did they know that you and, and, and your brother... The were? Germans knew who the Jews were. My mother already for a long time told me she couldn't buy meat, they wouldn't allow it, she can't bring meat, I loved sausages. I said, Mummy, why can't I have a sausage? She said, they don't let me buy it. They only give us what's left of whatever. So I just want to show you have your family uh, are many generations in Germany. There were many generations. Yes. I had about four generations that I know of. And is this from both sides? Your I had a, and your father's Are side. you sitting comfortably? Very, very comfortable. But here, if you could show Hanita the picture of your your four generations, you have a wonderful picture. Yes, that's my grandmother and grandfather. They were fantastic people, and that's my mother. The little baby is my mother. I remember that picture. So this is four generations of the Lowy family. Okay. Your paternal grandmother and your mother's the baby. My mother's the baby. <laughs> and then Ken. My grandfather uh, Kushenthal with the big warehouse, he was uh, in Schwerin. And my mother was born in Schwerin. And they had a department. It's only when store. she married my father that she came to Berlin. But uh, she was a Schwerin uh, Mecklenburg lady. This is a picture of your, your mother and your father. Nahan. And your family had a very, a very large departmental store. Yes. In which town was the, the store? In which town was the store? Yeah. In my grandfather's? Schwerin, Mecklenburg. He was like a king in that town. It was the biggest place there was. And everybody knew him and everybody loved him until the Nazis started. So here's the picture of... And the store was a four a departmental store. It was four, four stories. Again, four-storied warehouse, the biggest in Mecklenburg. He was a very rich man. And you know, they took him to, uh, I went back to Schwerin. Um, and we had somebody who received us there, who learned, or was at present, he was a young man, at the time that these things were happening, he'd learned about them, and he was given us as a madrich, as a leader, to tell us and show us exactly what happened to my grandfather. That was amazing. 
and he he showed us that opposite where my grandfather's big uh, business was, there was a um, a building where there was one woman living there, and she took my grandfather into her rooms. She had a it was a big house, but they showed us only the bottom door. They said could we were not allowed to go in. There were private people living there already, and you, you can't disturb them every time. So uh, they put all the Jews. They showed us the room. My grandfather and all the Jews of Shurin in that little room. They say it was about 170 people. They, they were. Uh, couldn't breathe before they took them to Auschwitz. That was the sad end. So, Kenneth, you have such a beautiful picture of you or the bicycle with your brother, with Hans. <laughs> and this is, I think, in 1938. You were very close with your brother. So, here, this, we have the same picture, but a, a bit enlarged. And um, you were in the forest in the spring of 1938. Nahon. Do you remember Kristallnacht? Yes. It was a terrible night. Of course I do. You can't forget it. What, what do you remember? Yeah. All of a sudden, there's outside the windows, we were on the third floor. Outside the windows, suddenly light turns out, flames and fire. And we heard downstairs that they were bashing in windows. You, you heard the sound and you couldn't and any and they had huge high things they got to the second floor third floor and all the time bashing in the windows that's the glass and uh, then my parents said to me you're not going out you just stay well I was shaking hiding behind the couch <laughs> and do you remember when you were very young when Hitler came to power in 33. 33. But, but yeah. do you remember how, was it a very strange atmosphere going outside? Do you remember the swastikas? I had actually an experience with Hitler, in, not uh, alone. We were at the uh, 1936 sports, the, um, the Olympics. Uh, Olympics. So I was in the sports team and Hitler came to shake hands with the children. But before he came, I was told to put my hands at the back of my, at the back. So he didn't shake my hand and I didn't understand that. I had no idea and I went home crying bitterly. I said, all the other children, they were shaking Hitler's hand. I wasn't allowed. Somebody held my hands at my back. Why? You know what my father answered? I don't know. He didn't say because we're Jewish But or... he knew, but he knew. Oh, he knew. He knew exactly what was happening. My mother too. And you remember that incident with Hitler seeing him? You, Ken. you were very close up. And then the next thing I knew, after being in the cellar and the sports thing was before that, but one day my father said to me, we've got a new uh, shirt for you and a new sweater and uh, you have a new suitcase. And I got terrified. I said, what have I got a new suitcase for? Where am I going? 
without words, he said, come Sean, and gave me on my bottom a <laughs> little pat, come Sean. Holding my hand, he said, I'm with you, don't worry. But then he said to me, when we got to the kinder transport on the, uh, where the boat was waiting, or the train it was, first a train, then a boat, and he said to me, now run to all those little children. You see where all those little children are? Now run for your life. And I said, but father, where are you? He said, you just run to the little children. And gave me a thing on my bottom, and that was the last contact I had. Can, it, can I just mention, before your father took you, you and your brother were taken to have photographs and you had this amazing photograph with you and your brother. Yes. They all, my parents already knew what was going to be. I, we didn't. Do you remember going to have the photograph taken? I remember the photograph. And we had no idea why it was taken. Who could believe? Who could think? Who could... No normal person could think what was going to be. And your parents took the photo because they wanted to show if people in England would, were you willing to accept? Uh, I went to uh, my foster parents in England. Uh, I don't know ever except that my foster mother, whom I came to, the family I came to in England, she was in Vizzo. You've heard of Vizzo. <clears throat> and she was in Vizzo, and they were taking children into their homes. Now, she, Liverpool, the boat docked in Liverpool. She didn't know, she didn't want, she didn't volunteer, because she was scared. She, no, she had no children of their own, and unfortunately they were always quarrelling and she didn't think it was a home to bring children, a child into. But she didn't even know that the idea was that they should adopt a child. And uh, when we got to Liverpool and we were standing there at the uh, train station, uh, I saw she had just the same, the picture of what you have there of my brother and I. This is the picture. That famous picture, Ken. And I ran away. I think I can see my husband at the other yeah. side. <laughs> I, I ran away looking for my brother because I see us both. I was so happy. I said, he's also here. So I'm going to look for him. I went crazy. And uh, somebody uh, brought me, I don't know how I got back to my foster mother, but uh, she said, your brother isn't here. Now, can, it, can I ask, when you left on that day, when, when your father took you, I think your brother, they locked him in the, in the bathroom. Ken, okay. you're right, you're right. I there, must have, there must have been... He so knocked on the door, he, he, he kicked the door. Lies, go on, geh nicht ohne mich. Lies, go nicht, Lies, he called me, Annelies, Lies. Geh nicht ohne mich. That's what I remember. I'm Don't sure. go without me. Don't go without me. So you have pictures in your book where it's you and your brother. You can see you were both extremely close. You were, yes. you such wonderful pictures with you and your brother it and Mrs. It was a terrific relationship. It you gain a half difference. And here, that's a very special picture of you with the bicycles, and this is with your, your, your father. And before you went, um, you have this also very special picture with your mother, with your brother and you. Yes, at the Bed Cafe. It was a, it was a farewell. Uh, whoever went to a Bed Cafe. <laughs> It was, it was this the first time that you were in a coffee in home? A coffee in a coffee place, yeah. 
And you can see even the and cup I of no coffee. I have no idea of the reason. And your parents never spoke to you? They never said... No. They never spoke in front of us and they never told us. My brother knew. He, uh, he was told by his friends, he was older, he went to school, I didn't go to school. He was sent out of school, <laughs> they weren't allowed to learn at school. So he knew what was going on, but I had no idea. And the, the, the day that you left, do you remember leaving your home? Did you think it was going to be something temporarily? You didn't know that you were never coming back? It never occurred to me. I don't... Uh, the whole business of my father saying uh, on my bottom, no comp, Sean, that's all I remember. And then he took me and said, go over to the little children. But before there. you went, did your mother kiss you goodbye or...? I looked for him. I thought he would be there too. And your mother, before no. you left the house? My mother was a statue at home. Do you think this is because... She was broken. Because of what they heard, what, what happened to you? She knew, she knew what was happening. She knew I was leaving. She knew her son, my brother, didn't get the same opportunity. And she knew what his fate would be. So it was a terrible thing for a mother. You have to let your little daughter go to save her life because that's the situation, but you're, I've often thought of it, but your brother, but your son can't go to save his life. So he's got to stay with you and father and take the same fate. Because I was on the last transport. And Renita, can I ask, before that, terrible incident when you were taken to the cellar. Were your parents very loving? Was it a loving family? Were you all very close? My, my, I didn't get the question. Before that terrible incident when you were, when the boys took you to the cellar and you were there for two weeks, but before, were, were you a close family? Were your parents very loving? Were they very warm to you? Yes. We were very warm. And your mother was loving and... But when I came back, my brother was, was the one who, who found me. And he brought me back. We, we didn't speak, speak on the way. Well, I couldn't. I, I, he sort of dragged me and you know, I couldn't walk. But can I ask, before that... I never found out how he found out. But before that incident, was your mother very loving? Did she used to hug and kiss you? Were Ken. your parents... So maybe when they heard the news, it we traumatized were. them that they, they... It's such a trauma to hear that this has happened to your daughter. Ken. And it changed them. It was a... Uh, it was a terrible thing to see the whole... Uh, only a three-room little house. <laughs> But the whole house was sort of like an iceberg. You were scared to talk, you were scared to hug, you were scared to, to look out of the window. And I wanted to go and play, I didn't know what was happening. But you had a happy childhood growing up. You had a okay. very, very with, with loving parents. With loving parents, loving brother. It just finished like that and changed to an iceberg. So what's very sad, and it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, thank God, it's another miracle that you were saved. And I think your brother, he was the one that helped you recover and... Yes. He, maybe he was... Maybe your parents just couldn't cope with he, it, maybe. He was the strength in my recovery because my, my father was broken, my mother was a statue and I didn't know where I was and then came this lady, this Goish lady, Tante Bok. she 
worked with my father in the business. She kept the business going with the Nazi in it. He had no idea who she was. What, what type of business was She it? was non-Jewish. What type of business did your father have? Uh, stuff, uh, material. You know, packs and packs of material that you unpack on the table and a long table. We used to play on that table up and down. And, and did you have your neighbors and in the building that you lived in, did you have any other friends or German children that you got on well with? In, in Germany, in the in Uferstraße 13? <laughs> no. No. It was just from school. My, my brother went to school and he had friends that he met outside, on the path outside the house. My mother said, you're not bringing them home. And uh, I often asked, can I go with? She didn't really want me to. But uh, I was, wasn't always listening to her. So when she wasn't looking, I was out. <laughs> And Kenneth, do you remember the Nazi youth marching or do you remember the Nazi party and the rallies? Do you remember any of I remember. And I've also been back uh, a long time ago with my husband and we traced everything. And my children have been back. My grandchildren have been back. I have now two grandchildren living in Germany. And to bring it up to date, it was my birthday a couple of weeks or less ago. And they, on my birthday, my grandson and his girl, non-Jewish German girlfriend, because he, he studied in a German university because of my rights. Unfortunately, uh, he and his sister, my granddaughter, both are marrying non-Jewish German. Uh, and that's how the circle goes around. Life is a circle. But there must be a little, a little bit difficult. It must uh, be. It's the most amazing thing. It's. Uh, It's because they were they could, because of my German passport, which I kept, as well as the Israeli, enable enable them to learn in Germany. I thought it's a good idea. Germany is a friendly country, another language, it's good education. If they want to, they can go. As far as I'm concerned, and they learned there without paying for. Uh, university was free and here it's tens of thousands of so I said if you want to go that's my what I can take back from the Germans what they did to me it's, it's thousands of marks you're taking from them by taking their education freely I said you've got all my uh, uh, best wishes to go and do it so my granddaughter became a lawyer. Another granddaughter became an engineer. And um, I have eight grandchildren, uh, ten grandchildren. And how's your feeling that they married German? It, it was a funny feeling at first. I couldn't quite swallow it. And then I said, life goes on, the world has changed, and you've got to give it a chance. And they knew exactly what they're doing. So if you fall in love, and then they can always come here. Yeah. And look, there was a German lady that helped you when, and she risked her life to help you after that terrible incident when your parents yeah, that's right. were so traumatized. 
כן. שוב, so what, can we go back? It's, because it's so, it's so sad, but it's so, it must have been the most difficult situation that your parents were in, that they took this photograph, and there is a lady in, in Liverpool, Mrs. Levy, who saw the photo, and she said that she can only take one. She can only take you, and she can't take your brother. That's correct. But that, that must have been know, so hard for your parents. It's and you know what? I was put, they had a beautiful home. I had a bedroom with two beds, beautiful embossed wood, a pink carpet wall to wall, nothing missing. But the other bed rem remained empty. So, you know, it, it took me years to forget and forgive and all that problem. You had the means, why not? And I never asked, I, co I couldn't, couldn't get the question out. They were so kind to me, but I knew at the age of 17 I'm going on Hakshara, I'm going to Israel. They wanted to give me a higher education, I didn't want it. I want to go to Israel to build up Israel, I went to a kibbutz. I met my husband on Hakshara. This is a picture of Mrs. Levy, and she worked for, um, in the Liverpool, she, they were active, she was active in the, I think with Witzo in the, Mrs. Levy, she was... Um, ah, um, that was, I was about 14 then. It was the summer school uniform. And that's my foster mother. She's 20 years yeah, yeah, older than me. And was she, was she very loving to you? Um, she wasn't a very loving person. And I always had this little bit of thing against her. Why didn't you take my brother, you know? So I couldn't even give her my full love either. So, um, we managed, we were, very, we were very good friends, very, uh, but there was no hugging and... Uh, and your not foster really, father? Not really. <laughs> and and the, your father, your foster father? Um, he, he, he was more warm. He was warmer than she was. But uh, I, I couldn't give them the love I appreciated everything they did and I kept telling them, you saved my life, I say it today, but um, I, it doesn't mean that I can give you my full love, because something was left behind. <laughs> Elisa, can I ask you, when you, when your father took you, I met the last, it was the last killer transport, when you went and when your father took you to, and you saw the other children, and they all had name tags. Yes, we we all had uh, these uh, little. But you didn't know that you're going away and you're going to England. You never know. Your parents didn't tell you. No. So there must have been a major trauma for you. How how old were you? Nine. When you, when you were sent on the Kenner transport, and did you know any of the other children that you were with? I, I'm a very friendly kind of person, can you hear? Seemingly. <laughs> so I quickly made friends and became one of them, but n no particular friend. And when, you, and when, when your father left, he didn't hug you or kiss you or say goodbye? And left me with a, with a crowd of kids and hop, off you go. <laughs> that was it. Maybe they thought I'll see you again. I know. I think he couldn't part from me. I think. I always think that he maybe didn't have the strength to say goodbye. To part. So it must, it's one of the hardest decisions a parent can make. Can. Not knowing if they're going to see their child again, not knowing where they're going to really. Uh -huh. 
and my my fo my uh, mother didn't come with. She was already a problem for him because she, she was looking out of the window all the time like a statue. On the uh, on the place outside the window where they attacked me. I don't ever know what what happened. I know they both got to Auschwitz, and. Uh, I got the um, letter from Auschwitz through friends, by the way. They didn't give out inf information. And I had here uh, two uh, newspaper men from Germany who wanted my story. And uh, I asked one of them, can you go and um, now I've forgotten what we were talking Maybe to find out more information about your parents. If they can, to, uh, can you maybe find out from somebody where my parents got to at all, where they, where they went and they told me they were in Theresienstadt and from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz in 44. 44. Okay. And my brother in Dachau, also 44, August. He was found lying on the floor. They took him to, when they were already cleaning after the war finished, a cleaning Dachau. And they apparently found him on the floor still half alive and like many others they took them to a hospital and tried to give them food and warmth and it didn't work my brother died and the the two newspaper men from germany found that out they went to dachau they went a lot of trouble for me when they were here i took them to the sea and i looked after them and they food and lodging and they spoke to many Israelis and they did that for me. They uh, found out what really happened. Can I ask, what do you remember about the trip when you on the kinder transport going to England? What memories do you have going on a train and then the, the, the boat? Uh, I have very little memory. Uh, it, it's all like a black thing. And uh, because at first for me it was a shock to be without my brother. I knew already, I'd passed already things that uh, he wasn't there. And again he's not there. And where am I going? And where are my parents? And it, it, I'm not the only one. I'm a, all the other children must have felt the same. And. Um, I think I was very lucky to have a personality that uh, naturally sees, tries to see the happy side of something. And um, I think that helped me a lot. As soon as I met the other children, I sort of forgot everything else. And we had fun, and we, we, but we were on a boat, uh, first on a train and on a boat. On the boat, we weren't allowed to go up on the deck. We had to stay downstairs, and that's again in the dark. They weren't allowed to know the people on the deck. They were also Jews running away from Germany to England. It was a boat going from Germany to England. And I remember we, the naughty girl that I always am, I had to have a look and peep. <laughs> at the top deck and see what's there. And I, uh, my friends helped me, lifted me up. I was very light, weighed nothing. And uh, I saw that um, people had fur coats and it was hot. And they had fur coats and two fur coats, one on top of another. 
they were all Jewish people trying to take as much property. So I understood later. They had fur coats to cover the property and another fur coat, <coughs> oops, to cover the property that they could hide in the fur coats. In fur coats you can't see. And uh, you just go on the boat and you, you can't ever take your coat off. And that's what I was told. They were, they were taking all their property that they could in their fur coats. I didn't have a fur coat. <laughs> and can I ask, when you got to England, did Mrs. Levy come to the train station or how did, did you go straight away to Liverpool or? When the boat landed, all these foster parents were standing on the wharf and they had pictures because they didn't know who we were, we didn't know who they were. And my foster mother had a picture of both of us. This is the picture that she had. And this is a picture of you and your brother. That's the picture she had. We had that taken especially when we left. And when you saw her, could you speak any English at this time or? No. So it must have been a very they difficult... Didn't, they didn't even know Yiddish in Liverpool. <laughs> Jewish, Jewish family in Liverpool, England, and they didn't even know Yiddish. So the first two weeks they sent me to Brighton to a summer school. I must have arrived in June. And um, they sent me to this uh, summer school in Brighton Jewish summer school and there I met many children I'm a very friendly kind of person put it all behind me and just made fun with the kids maybe they were all like me I don't know who came from same thing I wouldn't know but they were my first English friends and we all talked English we spoke English. And you could speak, uh, you could start speaking? Okay. And when I came back to Liverpool, I was speaking English. After two weeks? Yeah. Renita, do you remember the, roughly the name of the boat or do you remember the date that you left on the kinder transport? That I went on the kinder transport? No. But it was one of the last the last kinder transports to leave Germany. But it was the last one to leave Germany. It was the very last one. Can. So this is the third miracle how you were saved. Because if you wouldn't have been on that kinder transport... I would have had the same fate as my brother. And I kept looking for him on the boat, I kept looking for him everywhere. Did your parents ever correspond? Did you ever get letters from, from your parents when you were in Liverpool? Uh, I did in the beginning, the first two weeks, something like that but the letters took a long time to come and by the time they came things in Germany had already changed so I, I could never write back you got these letters on one side it's them and, and you turn over and you return the letter to the address well I never managed that they all came back to me, to my Liverpool address. So... And in Liverpool, did your, your foster parents, did they send you to a Jewish school? Yes, in, at the time in Brighton, that was a Jewish school when I arrived to learn English. And you went... After that, no. A normal high school in Liverpool. Five minutes... Um, it took me about 10 minutes to walk there every day. And did you make friends easily when you were in Liverpool? Yes. I made friends at school and they weren't Jewish. It wasn't a Jewish school. And did the foster family, the Levies, did they, were they traditional? Did they keep 
anything on Shabbat? T- so traditional kind. Did okay. they go to synagogue to show? No, they did when I became uh, uh, twelve years old. Bat mitzvah. Bat mitzvah. They went to shul, and then. Um, I started with little boyfriends at the bottom. I used to get off the seat and go down with the friends that I'd already made before. I suddenly see them sitting down there in the men's thing, and they said to me, come on, come on up. So when mummy, I called them mummy and daddy, when mummy saw that that's what I was doing, she said, I'm going for you to Shula, so leave it. So we went shopping to town instead. Sure. <laughs> that's the kind of Jewish uh, that they were. But uh, festivals, uh, also they didn't keep all of them. I think just Rosh Hashanah and Pesach or something. And how did you feel? Because you didn't know much Judaism in Germany, and here you. You were introduced to a bit of... A bit of Judaism. How, how did you feel knowing what it is like to yeah. be Jewish? And enough, uh, I joined Habonim, if you've heard of Habonim. I joined Habonim and then heard of going to Israel. How that, old were you when you joined Habonim? And then I was finished. That was my... Can uh, <laughs> you how old were you when you joined the Habonim? Can. How old? How old? Uh, about 13, 14. Can. The social, the social age. It's there that I had the social time. And uh, believe you me, I had three nice boyfriends. Not special boyfriends, but friends who were boys. And two girls. None of them came to Israel. The funny thing, they stayed in Liverpool. But uh, I never regret it, and we had a wonderful time. And having such wonderful friends also enabled me to forget all the horrible terrors that I had before. I'm kinere that kind. I don't sit on yesterday if it was a bad day. I say, okay, let's look what's today and tomorrow. Can I ask, when the war ended in 45, um, did you, or did the Levies try to find out what happened to your parents or to reunite you again with your parents? I didn't understand the question. When the war ended in 45. Ah, kid. And did the Levies try to find out what was the fate of your parents or your brother or to try to reunite? Uh, I lost contact already a year or two before. I mean, the war lasted many years yeah. and I'd already lost the contact. So I did everything to find them and couldn't find them. Uh, even what happened to them. Until, as I said, I had these uh, visitors here, the, the Journalists. So before that, you never knew? You no. I never knew. My parents were in Auschwitz, which is obviously uh, you can't come out of Auschwitz unless you're lucky. But with your brother, I think what, when you were. I, I was in, looking for him a long time after that. And I think after the war, there were some of the survivors that you met at Habonim or at the camp and they had numbers on their arms. Um, and they, one or two mentioned that they knew your brother, that they were with him in Dachau? Um, I, I did mention it. Yeah. I didn't want to face it. Sure. I never talked about it. I never, never talked about it for years. And did the other children your your friends, because your accent must have been a little bit with, did you have a bit of a German accent as well? Yes. Did they ask you about your upbringing or Germany or how you left Germany or being on the kinder transport? No. My friend, my English friends, 
We never talked about it. And with the Levies, with your adoptive parents, did they, foster parents, did they ask you about your life in Germany or? Never. They never discussed your life before? Uh, they all, they and my friends, they and my par foster parents, um, they, they couldn't bring up the subject. They took me for what I am today and that's it. Looking back, would you have preferred if they would have asked you if you could have spoken about it? I don't know if I could have talked about it. I don't know where I would start. I uh, preferred that the, even that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't want pity. And uh, I just wanted to go on with life with these wonderful new friends and not to spoil it. My fear was to spoil it if I would mention it. And my foster parents uh, never asked. And, uh, and when did you meet your, your wonderful husband? Ah! <laughs> this is a picture. Ken. So he was also, a rich, he was born in Germany. He was also born in Germany and he was in the British Army for six years fighting the Germans. How, d how did he leave he Germany? He was at Dunkirk and he uh, knew French, he grew up in France. Did he leave with his family to France? And he did a lot of spy work to prepare Dunkirk but can on I a motorbike. Can I ask, how did he leave Germany? Did he leave with his parents? Yes, he had, he had a mother. I never knew her. Mother and father. No, father not. His father, of course, he's got a father, but um, he was German, the father. And the mother never, he divorced him. The minute the trouble started, they decided to divorce. And he never knew him. Was he was he Jewish? His father? No, no, he's German. German, German, non-Jew. And the mother divorced. She she married Ken. She married a German non-Jew. And then did she go with with the, uh, Auschwitz? She never survived. Yeah. She never survived. I never had the pleasure of meeting her. She must have been a very strong woman. And your husband, did he speak to you a little bit, a lot about his early years? How Never. He talked to his children. <laughs> but not to you? He talked to his sons when I wasn't around. You never discussed it together? No. We couldn't, but he did with his sons, and uh, but not with me. We just lived our life as it was, looked to the future, and uh, carried on. So he was also involved in Habonim. Yes, he was in Habonim. He wasn't really in Habonim. Um, I was. And he came to see Havonim. He heard about it. And um, one of the friends uh, said to him, well, come again. You know, we're, we're going on a tiul. Come, come with us. Was he much older than you? Yes, eight years. Eight years, because this is at the age of 25. 25. When he was just right. out of the British Army. And he was actually in Dunkirk. Yes, he was one of what we call Halutzim, <laughs> one of the early ones to go into Dunk because he knew French. He had a complete French accent, and uh, they sent him as a you know to spy over the house, the best way to do it. He was a very brave person. I mean, only that I say it because of his, I'm his wife was his wife, but uh, he was. 
<laughs> there were no flies on him, if you know what I mean. And did he have any siblings? Any brothers or sisters? No. No brothers or sisters. And when, when did you decide to get married? Uh, we met, he, he came on, on Hachshara, when I was on Hachshara already, to prepare for Israel in the south of uh, England. He was a soldier, in ex-soldier in Britain, with no family, nobody, and somebody said to him, why don't you go on Hachshara to Israel? Make your family. You've got nobody in England to keep you here. Why, why are you here? So they, they were already the the friend who, who said that to him had already been to my Hachshara. There were a few in England. There were thirteen or something. And, but we were a bit posher, and uh, it was um, the house of. Uh, uh, one of the big stores in England, the head of the store was his summer house. It was lovely on a lake, beautiful, beautiful situation to prepare for Israel, mad. <laughs> but there you are. So they said to him, go there, it's a nice place. His friend said to him, if you're thinking of going to Israel, maybe. It wasn't Israel, it was Palestine at the time and uh, see what you feel. So he went on a trip before I was in Israel. He went, it was still Palestine. Was well, under the British mandate. But he was a British soldier so he could go. So he went on a trip and he was taken in, very much so. So when he came back, he came on Akshara. <laughs> and he said, you know, I've seen Israel beautiful place. I said, oh, I'm glad you like it. And, uh, well, he had his eye on me. I didn't uh, think that a person eight years older than me should have his eye. I said to him, go to the other girls, 22, 26. I was 17. I said, go to the other Leave me alone. He said, but I like you. He used to ask the other girls to keep a chair by the dining room table. For me, we all ate together. So he said, that chair is Hanita's. No, it wasn't Hanita, it was Lee, Annalise Lee. And uh, he said, that's Lee's place. Nobody used to take that place. And he sat next to me. And so we, you know, I sort of said, oh, it's not so bad. I said to myself, <laughs> he's not going to hurt you anyway. Uh, try and make friends. So we, he said one day, let's go round the lake. There was a big lake. And by the end, we'd been round the lake. We were almost engaged. <laughs> I realized what a grand person he was. And I would really be missing out on that. And if he likes me, well... So that that walk around the lake, it took about almost three hours. And uh, he persuaded me and uh, that's it. And where did you get married? Uh, we got married on the kibbutz. We were the first couple on Kvarnasi who got married on the kibbutz. The others got married before me but they had to go to the, the rabbi in Metula. But this time he said, I'm coming to the kibbutz and you're going to make a wedding for this couple. And here we have the, these beautiful pictures of your wedding. Ah, you've got there, yeah. that one. So we were the first couple to get married on the kibbutz. And were your foster parents, did they manage to come to the wedding? No, but they came later took them a long time to come to the kibbutz there till they decided they've got to lashlimi ma'inyan <laughs> but they were happy for you they they what they were happy for you that you were getting married yes actually 
On Hakshara, we got a, today you call it engaged. Mm. When we decided to get married, I phoned them up and to Liverpool on Hakshara. And uh, I said to them, I, I have news, I'm going to get married. But you, so my mother said, foster mother said, but you didn't, we were there last weekend. You didn't introduce us to anybody. Where is he? He had already been taken to Israel. We didn't know that. By, on a spur of a moment, he was asked, he was a, in the army, quite a high place. They said, we need you, come. And he wasn't there that weekend. And I said, I couldn't, and I was not allowed to say that he'd gone to Palestine. So I said, oh, he was called there by his friend. I don't know what I said. Got out of it somehow. <laughs> but uh, later on, it became the joke of the family. But uh, at the time, after that, my foster mother met Bob uh, on, on Hachshara, and they sat back to back. She, she couldn't, she came to see me before we were married, but she couldn't accept him. How can you do that to me? You didn't tell me, and you, you, you didn't, I asked where was he, and you said you can't tell me. Well, well, it all ended well, we got married, and uh, when my first daughter was born, not the one you saw today, uh, they came to see us on the kibbutz, first time. So when did, when did you first come to Israel? In 49. 49. And you, you must remember, I'm sure when they had the partition and then when they had the vote at the UN and when the state was declared. Yes, I was then uh, on Hachshara already and we took a truck one of the old trucks of the Hachshara. We all climbed on it, and we, when Israel was declared, as uh, Ben Gurion declared, and we all, we were in the countryside on Hachshara, it's in the countryside, and we walked all, we, we rode all around the country, Israel, it's Israel. <laughs> Ken, we had a great day, but that was in England still. And you, when you first came to Israel, how was your feelings when you eventually came here? Well, it was quite a shock that I remember. We were on Hachshara, or in a beautiful house. Mm -hmm. We had an electric drying cupboard, a washing machine. Uh, our beds were most comfortable. And here I come and I have to sleep in a... In a a dug down, um, what is it called? Because Syria was right opposite. Like a trench, maybe. A trench. We had to sleep in the trenches. <laughs> it was a terrific shock. And they put me in the kitchen for the children to cook for children. That sort of made me happier. I'd never cooked in my life, but uh, they looked all right. <laughs> And Hinita, coming, looking back on, on your life, you happy that you, that you came with your husband and, and you, you lived in Israel? Oh yes. I, I, uh, it, you asked me if I was happy that I came to Israel. Yeah. Every moment of the day, I don't regret it. I am sorry that Israel is in the state it is today, Dafka the young people are starting that. They don't know what we went through to get here. What Israel means to us, apparently, isn't quite the same thing as it means to the younger uh, ge generation. Uh, my children know my story, but not everybody's in the same position. So uh, it's, it's very sad. It makes me feel very sad actually, position of today. Please God, it, it will improve. Please God, we really hope and pray because we do I need... I think it's most unnecessary. It's totally unnecessary. Yeah. 
just talk and get together and, and what's all this ego play? It's Good ego play. Hemisa, can I just ask you, when you went back to Germany, was it difficult to go back? Uh, it was exciting. I couldn't have got back without my husband at my side. But did you have mixed feelings going back, knowing? Uh, not really. I got very excited when we got to my house and we went up the stairs, third floor right. And you remembered your house? You remembered? Then I remembered everything. And you could go inside? Then we went inside and there was an old man sitting there and an old lady and this, uh, we knocked at the door and the old, old man opened the door and I said, you know, I used to live here, can I have a look around? And the Germans didn't like that because a lot of Jews yeah. did that. They went back to the homes they were in and asked the people, told them they were there, they were Jewish. But uh, he was very nice, his wife wasn't. She was a bit frightened, scared. But uh, I said, I, I'm, I'm doing no harm, I'm taking no photos. I just want to feel the walls, feel the place, feel. And then she said, okay, and we, we finished. And no tea, no coffee, we went out. And that was it. And when you went to Dachau? When, when I went back to my home. But when you went to Dachau, that must have been very traumatic, very difficult. It was. My husband was with me and he was terrified of what's going to happen to me. So I said, if you stay by my side, I'm going to be okay. Just let me knock at the door. Third floor, right and say hello, but come with me. He came with me. And Hanita, you went to where your brother was, where he died, in Dachau? You went there as well? Yeah. How was, how was it going to Dachau, to the camp in Dachau? Very, very hard, very hard. In fact, uh, I was trembling when I was there. And I all got, got to this, there's a big stove where they burnt everybody. A crematorium, yeah, it's still there. A crematorium. It's, uh, it's, it's on, the, on the side, I, I was there. Okay. And they said to me, the people, uh, there was a watchman there, and he said, uh, the only place you should go to is the crematorium, because that's where it all happened. So I went there, and uh, I was glad I did that. It was like uh, I touched it and uh, <laughs> I hugged it, I remember. I leant on it and, and said, oh, Hans, I love you so much and I couldn't help you. Those were my last words. I love you so much, Hans. Was that? But I couldn't help you, I was too young. And I was saying to my foster parents, by the way, all the time, why can't you bring my brother over? You're not even trying. But I didn't realize that it was too late. I presume it was too late. They, they didn't even try. Because you were the last, you were the last. I was transport. the last transport. Yeah. And did you ever go to Auschwitz? I couldn't go in, I went to the gate. You couldn't go in? No. Just the gates. And Henita, did when you were married, did you speak to your children about your experiences? Do they know your story from... Were you open with your children? Did they know that you were a survivor? It's a good question. I couldn't. But when did it all come out? when uh, my foster mother was here to visit and they asked us both to appear on an English program. She is the lady who saved me and my story. 
And I said to, I called her mummy, mummy and daddy. I said to mummy, do you want to do that? She said, I think you should do it. So she came with me and the children heard the broadcast. And then uh, I knew I'd dropped the bomb, <laughs> as they say. But they already, thank God, they knew me as a happy mother and, uh, and my husband and everything was fine. I think you wanted your children to have a, a normal upbringing, not to be Ken, have any trauma or... Ken, I never, uh, I never let it uh, be a fog in the house. We, uh, we started uh, our family in Ashkelon, then we joined the kibbutz and we just went on with it. You went to Timorim for many years? In Timorim, we were in Timorim for 40 years, Moshav Shetufi, and never, never looked back. And Hanita, you have an amazing picture with uh, President Herzog. Oh, yes. The uh, Chaim Herzog, that's the father of our, our president now. Nachon. You know why? My foster parents, mommy and daddy, were married by his father. He was the chief rabbi. Yes. And when mommy came to see me in Israel, I promised to take her to see him. To see the to see uh, the chief rabbi. The son, well, the son, uh, to see Ken. Klein. And was he president at the time? And we went, we got permission from the House of... Well, I got the President's Prize for uh, something. And uh, I felt at home at the President's home. I'd been there because of the prize it's a few times. I knew the people there. So I said to my mate, But it's on. a Beit Hanasi. Ken. We had a lovely time. They received us so beautifully. So this is you and your, your dear mother, your foster mother, and President Chaim Herzog. Achon. And we took a photograph together, and she was happy. So, Chenita, just to thank God, our president today, the, the son, Yaakov Herzog, so he has, he's got a lot of wisdom, and uh, Let's hope that our leaders listen to him because he's he's a peacemaker and um, he wants to heal the country and the country needs to be healed. So it's amazing that you have this connection. Um, so Kenita, can I ask you, what message do you give to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and to the future generations? What message do you impart? I can say to them, Whatever happens to this country, it's yours. We are one people, one country, and it is worth, when you have to, to fight for it. If not, make it bloom, and make, make, make lovely families, and just make this your home. Wherever else you are, this, Israel, is your home. God bless you all. So, Hanita, I want to just thank you because <clears throat> for me, Hanita, I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I am so grateful to you. You are unique, unique in this world. <laughs> you know, no. you were saved by three miracles. Three miracles saved you, thank God, and it's just been the greatest honor and privilege. And I'm, <laughs> I am eternally grateful to you because hearing your story and just meeting you, it's the biggest honor in the world, really. Well, I thank you for all that, but I, I, I don't deserve You deserve but I'm everything, happy, but you should just I'm be happy well. I to know you and that you are doing this because it's also for my children. It's for the all future generations, it really Fun. is. And you are an example we can all, all strive to emulate. You really are. You, you had such adversity and look, you rose above everything. Fun. And And you're so happy and you're smiling and you're just amazing. Thank you, and you're I think very, I very, very special. I you should have all of Hashem's blessings, and you should just be well. And maybe stream to 120 
plus <laughs> thank you in good health and happiness and just have muzzle and broca from your family and from everyone thank you very much i would like you to have the same right, thank you so much i don't much. know you all everyone. your family i only know miriam but i oh. wish you the same thank you so much you and your wife i so appreciate it and thank you very much for what you're doing can you see here we're just going to end up with these by the way you haven't eaten or drunk can you see here are some wonderful photographs that you have wow and such memories these are such dear memories <laughs> and i really want to thank you for doing this this has been such an honor and a privilege